But these proceedings have been alternately fascinating, embarrassing, cringe-worthy, none more so than the pitiful figure of the once greatest law officer in the land, Lord Goldsmith, today. Never did I see a man so reduced in circumstance from such a great office. His attempts to persuade us that he'd gone for two years believing the war in Iraq to be illegal, but in seven short days between the 10th and the 17th of March, and only after a visit, as Lindsay put it, comically to the law officers of George W. Bush, the people who brought us Guantanamo and waterboarding and torture and disappearance. After such a conversation, he was persuaded that this war was, after all, legal. If there is anybody in the land who doesn't already believe that he changed his mind because it was too late to do anything else, because the liar and war criminal Tony Blair had already committed Britain to war, whatever the circumstances, at least the previous summer on Bush's ranch in Crawford, Texas. That's the truth of it. No one with any sense thinks otherwise. But the one that struck me most was Jack Straw, who told us how agonizing it had all been for him. Preceded by a blog written by his son. Now I know we can visit the sins of sons on their fathers or fathers on their sons, but it was a very interesting blog in which the son of Jack Straw condemned Tony Blair for ruining his father's career by hoodwinking him into believing the war on Iraq was necessary. It was reproduced across two pages in Mr. Lebedev's Evening Standard. For hoodwinking him about the war, and then, and you gather this was rather more important, cruelly reducing him from Foreign Secretary to being in charge of the price of sausages in the canteen as the leader, so-called, of the House of Commons after how loyal he had been. But Straw told us how agonizing it had all been. And yet Goldsmith told us today, when the Attorney General of the United Kingdom asked to brief the Cabinet on the balance of his thinking on the legality of the war, Jack Straw refused to allow the Attorney General to enter Downing Street. Presumably he would have barred the door if Goldsmith had turned up, if he'd had the backbone to turn up in any case. Now maybe Britain was always like this. Maybe some of us just looked at it through rose-colored glasses. But I was conferring with Mr. Ben a moment ago. There was a time in Britain where the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Labour Chancellor of the Exchequer, Hugh Dalton, had to resign as Chancellor of the Exchequer because he whispered an aside to a journalist as he entered the chamber to deliver his budget speech, one or two of the nuggets that were going to be in that speech. There was a time in Britain, more recently, when the Minister for War, Conservative Minister for War, John Profumo, had to apologize to the House, resign from the government, and leave public life forever because of whom he was sleeping with or whom she was also sleeping with. There was a time in Britain, I like to think, when mendacity on the scale that's been demonstrated even in the milksop Chilcot inquiry would have resulted in the absolute destruction of the political careers of the leading figures so implicated. And it's a measure of how reduced we have become that these criminals, Blair accepted, though he's gone on to even more lucrative things, are still running the country. 
they are still the people in the cabinet and the government even though they've been exposed as brazen liars and overwhelmingly believed to have launched what the Nuremberg Tribunal called the gravest of all crimes, the launching of an aggressive war. I listened to Goldsmith today and the panel dancing on the end of a needle. At no stage did anybody say from the panel or Goldsmith volunteer from the dock that the entire thing had been built upon a completely false prospectus. Goldsmith talked endlessly about Iraq being in breach of the United Nations resolutions when it turned out it was in breach of no United Nations resolutions. It didn't have any weapons of mass destruction. The tribunal could have found that on the first day. You launched this war based on something that turned out to be entirely false. So how can you come before a tribunal and say that you still stand by the decisions that you made because you made them on an entirely false basis? Now I've written to the Chilcot Inquiry today, I think if they can have their say, I ought to have mine. I was, after all, the British parliamentarian most often in Iraq during the run-up to the war. I was the last British parliamentarian to meet with the Iraqi president, Saddam Hussein. I helped persuade him to allow Blicks and the arms inspectors back into the country. And I told anyone who would listen in the run-up to the war that it would turn out exactly as it has. But the one person who wouldn't listen was Tony Blair. When I returned from Baghdad in August of 2002, I wrote to Tony Blair telling him that I've just had an hour and a half meeting with the president of a country with whom you are obviously bent on war. I think I should tell you what he had to say. And Blair replied that he would not be able to meet me. But I hope to get the chance to say it at the Chilcot Inquiry. But if not, I'll say it outside the Chilcot Inquiry on Friday. This war, the Afghan war, the spreading stain of war that Seamus talked about. They seem intent on spreading their war, two, three, four, five Vietnams. I tell you, I know Yemen rather well. If the United States Marine Corps wants to invade Yemen, good luck to them, because they'll find exactly the same response from the people of Yemen that they have experienced in Iraq and Afghanistan. But these are, I believe, spasms of violence from the imperialist countries which are signs of weakness rather than strength. They're double your money bets and each double your money bet loses like the last one. Terrorism is spreading. The Al-Qaeda mentality multiplying the discrediting of the British and American political systems well advanced. The armies are bogged down and for them victory is impossible to achieve. In this country that our government has led us into disaster and that if we don't hold them to account they may lead us into further disasters yet. The war threatened against Iran, threatened against Yemen, is mirrored by their client state Israel in its threats of war against Lebanon again and against the Gaza Strip again. But none of these wars will work. A future of a world without war, without imperialism and without aggression by the strong against the weak is the vision that we hold up to the people. It's the one I'll be campaigning on in the general election. Salma Yaqub in, in Birmingham. Wasn't her performance on question time a couple of weeks ago. A case in point 
of the intellectual superiority of our position compared to the others. One lone anti-war voice, one young woman, Muslim woman, in of all places, Wooten Bassett, and she wiped the floor with the apologists for war throughout the entire show. And, and moreover, most of the audience were with her. And almost every question made reference to the contributions that she made. With a bit of luck, I'm on question time next week. We're getting plenty of opportunities. We're in business. People want to hear from us because they know that we were right and they were wrong. And that if people had listened to us, we wouldn't be in the mess we're in. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you very much indeed.